right, Leviticus 3, let's call this one Peace Part 2, because if you may recall or just want to thumb back through the playlist, we began in Genesis 1 with peace, and not too long ago, we talked about the ways in which repetition helps to establish themes, and that's a lot of what we're trying to do to connect these chapters and make them more than just isolated discussions of fun or interesting facts. And so now that we are at the beginning of the sacrificial system in the third chapter of Leviticus, peace coming back around, I believe, is more than just a coincidence since it is a regular part of uh, the statutes that generally regard atonement. But as we talked about a little bit on Sunday, these sacrifices really broke down into two categories that seem to both tie into different levels of gratitude. One level of gratitude being a tie to that whole concept of atonement. If someone has given you an opportunity to atone or make up for something that you've done wrong, common sense often says uh, our natural reaction should be to be grateful. And we tend to be more grateful the more forgiven we feel. Jesus is even going to say that later on when he talks about a woman who is washing his feet with her hair. She's described as a very sinful woman. Some of the onlookers are like, if he knew what this woman was guilty of, he wouldn't even let her touch him. But understanding their thoughts, he helped them understand just how much he understood about her and just how much she appreciated her level of forgiveness. And so that goes back to what we're talking about here. This whole altar in um, some of these sacrifices is helping to discern the degree to which we really appreciate or are grateful for our forgiveness. But it's not just being forgiven and sinning because before that, God willing, we're in a significant enough or uh, a stable enough place in our relationship with God and the people around us that we're simply appreciating blessings. And that is more akin to where we're at here in this peace offering because the peace offering is discussed not only here in chapter three, but also in chapter seven. And it's going to break down roughly into three categories. And it's going to be uh, essentially, probably we'll talk about it and maybe even title chapter seven, Thanksgiving. And so we have a concept of Thanksgiving where we set out time once a year in America generally to give thanks for the origins of uh, what we've uh, traditionally told is our story of how things got started here and our levels of gratitude for what it's become. Uh, likewise, it could be offered as a vow. A lot of times vows would be offered in times when a person was in despair and uh, they didn't necessarily know how things were going to go, but they would vow to the Lord, if you get me through this, Lord, this is what um, I'm vowing to give you. And there are some serious consequences to making a vow. It says better not to vow at all than to vow and to not pay. And so this is the system of um, the portion of the peace offering that was connected to vows. And then likewise, it was a free will offering. Those are the three components. But understand this. I think I started to understand um, the way this offering breaks down when I was on the mission field dealing with um, um, significant levels of poverty over and over again as a part of daily life. Um, it began to change my attitude towards prosperity. See, as a Christian, I often believe that it was our obligation to use the funds that we had to help people who were in need. And I still believe that. But at a certain point, I simply gained a minimal level of relief anytime I saw people who had enough. And so that was one of the side um, effects of being on the mission field. I stopped focusing on what I thought our obligation was as privileged people, and I really just began to thank God anytime I saw someone who wasn't in need. And in many ways, that's what the peace offering represents here. See, because part of the uh, emphasis at the end of chapter 3 is this in verse 16, and the priest shall burn them on the altar as a food offering uh, with a pleasing aroma. All fat is the Lord's. It shall be a statute forever throughout your generations in all your dwelling places that you eat neither fat nor blood. And the peace offering isn't the only place where um, the fat belonged to God because it always belonged to God, whatever the type of sacrifice. But the fat represented that their relationship with God was at least at a certain level. Why? Because when we get to the end of Leviticus in chapter 26, he's going to talk about blessings for obedience to this law and curses for disobedience. And what he's going to say in verse 21 is this. Then if you walk contrary to me and will not listen to me, I will continue striking you. Verse 22, I will destroy your livestock and make you few in number. And so the very fact that they had livestock to offer represented the fact that no matter how unstable their relationship with God was, there was at least a level of peace where he had not begun to consume their livestock. And much like I began to appreciate on the mission field for God, it at least represented a level of peace that says, no matter how much better our relationship could be, uh, we're at least at a point where they have enough.